Chapter Two, Part Four of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter Two, The Ten Primitive Persecutions, Part Four. The Christians, about this time, upon mature consideration, thought it unlawful to bear arms under the heathen emperor. Maximilian, the son of Fabius Victor, was the first beheaded under this regulation. Vitus, a Sicilian of considerable family, was brought up a Christian. When his virtues increased with his years, his constancy supported him under all afflictions, and his face was superior to the most dangerous perils. His father, Hylas, who was a pagan, finding that he had been instructed in the principles of Christianity by the nurse who brought him up, used all his endeavors to bring him back to paganism, and at length sacrificed his son to the idols, June the 14th, Anno Domini 303. Victor was a Christian of a good family at Marseilles, in France. He spent a great part of the night in visiting the afflicted, and confirming the weak, which pious work he could not, consistently with his own safety, perform in the daytime, and his fortune he spent in relieving the distresses of poor Christians. He was at length, however, seized by the Emperor Maximian's decree, who ordered him to be bound and dragged through the streets. During the execution of this order, he was treated with all manner of cruelties and indignities by the enraged populace. Remaining still inflexible, his courage was deemed obstinacy. Being by order stretched upon the rack, he turned his eyes toward heaven, and prayed to God to endue him with patience, after which he underwent the tortures with most admirable fortitude. After the executioners were tired with inflicting torments on him, he was conveyed to a dungeon. In his confinement he converted his jailers, named Alexander, Felician, and Longinus, this affair coming to the ears of the emperor, he ordered them immediately to be put to death, and the jailers were accordingly beheaded. Victor was then again put to the rack, and mercifully beaten with batoons, and again sent to prison. Being a third time examined concerning his religion, he persevered in his principles. A small altar was then brought, and he was commanded to offer incense upon it immediately. Fired with indignation at the request, he boldly stepped forward, and with his foot overthrew both altar and idol. This so enraged the emperor Maximian, who was present, that he ordered the foot with which he had kicked the altar to be immediately cut off, and Victor was thrown into a mill, and crushed to pieces with the stones, Anno Domini 303. Maximus, governor of Cilicia, being at Tarsus, three Christians were brought before him, their names were Tarachus, an aged man, Probus, and Andronicus. After repeated tortures and exhortations to recant, they at length were ordered for execution. Being brought to the amphitheatre, several beasts were let loose upon them, but none of the animals, though hungry, would touch them. The keeper then brought out a large bear, that had that very day destroyed three men. But this voracious creature, and the fierce lioness both refused to attach the prisoners. Finding the design of destroying them by the means of wild beasts ineffectual, Maximus ordered them to be slain by the sword on October the 11th, Anno Domini 303. Romanus, a native of Palestine, was diacon of the church of Caesarea at the time of the commencement of Diocletian's persecution. Being condemned for his faith at Antioch, he was scourged, put to the rack, his body torn with hooks, his flesh cut with knives, his face scarified, his teeth beaten from their sockets, and his hair plucked up by the roots. Soon after he was ordered to be strangled, November the 17th, Anna Domini 303. Susanna, the niece of Caius, bishop of Rome, was pressed by the emperor Diocletian to marry a noble pagan, who was nearly related to him. Refusing the honor intended her, she was beheaded by the emperor's order. 
Dorotheus, the high chamberlain of the household to Diocletian, was a Christian, and took great pains to make converts. In his religious labors he was joined by Gorgonius, another Christian, and one belonging to the palace. They were first tortured and then strangled. Peter, and Oino, belonging to the emperor, was a Christian of singular modesty and humility. He was laid on a gridiron, and brought over a slow fire, until he expired. Cyprian, known by the title of the magician, to distinguish him from Cyprian, bishop of Carthage, was a native of Natioch. He received a liberal education in his youth, and particularly applied himself to astrology, after which he travelled for improvements through Greece, Egypt, India, etc. In the course of time he became acquainted with Justina, a young lady of Antioch, whose birth, beauty, and accomplishments rendered her the admiration of all who knew her. A pagan gentleman applied to Cyprian, to promote his suit with the beautiful Justina. This he undertook, but soon himself became converted, burned his books of astrology and magic, received baptism, and felt animated with the powerful spirit of grace. The conversion of Cyprian had a great effect on the pagan gentleman who paid his addresses to Justina, and he in a short time embraced Christianity. During the persecutions of Diocletian, Cyprian and Justina were seized upon as Christians. The former was torn with pincers, and the latter chastised, and after suffering other torments, both were beheaded. Eulalia, a Spanish lady of a Christian family, was remarkable in her youth for sweetness of temper and solidity of understanding seldom found in the capriciousness of juvenile years. Being apprehended as a Christian, the magistrate attempted by the mildest means to bring her over to paganism, but she ridiculed the pagan deities with such asperity that the judge, incensed at her behavior, ordered her to be tortured. Her sides were accordingly torn by hooks, and her breasts burnt in the most shocking manner, until she expired by the violence of the flames, December, and no domine 303. In the year 304, when the persecution reached Spain, Dacian, the governor of Tarragona, ordered Valerius the bishop and Vincent the diacon to be seized, loaded with irons, and imprisoned. The prisoners being firm in their resolution, Valerius was banished, and Vincent was racked, his limbs dislocated, his flesh torn with hooks, and he was laid on a gridiron, which had not only a fire placed up under it, but spikes at the top, which ran into his flesh. These torments neither destroying him, nor changing his resolutions, he was remanded to prison, and confined in a small, loathsome, dark dungeon, strewed with sharp flints, and pieces of broken glass, where he died, January twenty second, three hundred and four. His body was thrown into the river. The persecution of Diocletian began particularly to rage, in Anno Domini three hundred and four, when many Christians were put to cruel tortures, and the most painful and ignominious death, the most eminent and particular of whom we shall enumerate. Saturninus, a priest of Albitina, a town of Africa, after being tortured, was remanded to prison, and there starved to death. His four children, after being variously tormented, shared the same fate with their father. Dativas, a noble Roman senator, Telico, a pious Christian, Victoria, a young lady of considerable family and fortune, with some others of less consideration, all auditors of Saturninus, were tortured in a similar manner, and perished by the same means. Agrape, Chonia, and Irene, three sisters, were seized upon at Thessalonica, when Diocletian's persecution reached Greece. They were burnt, and received the crown of martyrdom in the flames, March the 25th, Anno Domini 304. The governor, finding that he could make no impression on Irene, ordered her to be exposed naked in the streets, which shameful order having been executed, a fire was kindled near the city wall, amidst whose flames her spirit ascended beyond the reach of man's cruelty. Agato, a man of pious turn of mind, with Cacique, Philippa, and Oitichia, were martyred about the same time, but the particulars have not been transmitted to us. Marcellinus, bishop of Rome, 
who succeeded Caius in that seat, having strongly opposed paying divine honours to Diocletian, suffered martyrdom by a variety of tortures in the year 324, comforting his soul until he expired with the prospect of these glorious rewards it would receive by the tortures suffered in the body. Victorius, Carpophorus, Severus, and Severianus were brothers, and all four employed in places of great trust and honour in the city of Rome. Having exclaimed against the worship of idols, they were apprehended and scourged with a plumbiti, or scourges, to the end of which were fastened leaden balls. This punishment was exercised with such excess of cruelty that the pious brothers fell martyrs to its severity. Timothy, a diacon of Mauritania, and Maura, his wife, had not been united together by the bands of wedlock above three weeks, when they were separated from each other by the persecution. Timothy, being apprehended as a Christian, was carried before Arianus, the governor of Thebes, who, knowing that he had the keeping of the holy scriptures, commanded him to deliver them up to be burned, to which he answered, Had I children, I would sooner deliver them up to be sacrificed, than part with the word of God. The governor, being much incensed at this reply, ordered his eyes to be put out with red-hot irons, saying, The book shall at least be useless to you, or you shall not see to read them. His patience under the operation was so great that the governor grew more exasperated. He therefore, in order, if possible, to overcome his fortitude, ordered him to be hung up by the feet with a weight tied about his neck and a gag in his mouth. In this state, Maura, his wife, tenderly urged him for her sake to recant. But when the gag was taken out of his mouth, instead of consenting to his wife's entreaties, he greatly blamed her mistaken love, and declared his resolution of dying for the faith. The consequence was that Maura resolved to imitate his courage and fidelity, and either to accompany or follow him to glory. The governor, after trying in vain to alter her resolution, ordered her to be tortured, which was executed with great severity. After this, Timothy and Maura were crucified near each other, Anno Domini 304. Sabinus, bishop of Assisium, refusing to sacrifice to Jupiter, and pushing the idol from him, had his hand cut off by the order of the governor of Tuscany. While in prison, he converted the governor and his family, all of whom suffered martyrdom for the faith. Soon after their execution, Sabinus himself was scourged to death, December Anno Domini 304. Tired with the farce of state and public business, the emperor Diocletian resigned the imperial diadem, and was succeeded by Constantius and Galerius, the former a prince of the most mild and humane disposition, and the latter equally remarkable for his cruelty and tyranny. These divided the empire into two equal governments, Galerius ruling in the east, and Constantinus in the west, and the people in the two governments felt the effects of the dispositions of the two emperors, for those in the west were governed in the mildest manner, but such as resided in the east fell all the miseries of oppression and lengthened tortures. Among the many martyred by the order of Galerius, we shall enumerate the most eminent. Amphianus was a gentleman of eminence in Lucia, and a scholar of Eusebius. Julita, a Lycaonian of royal descent, but more celebrated for her virtues than noble blood, while on the rack her child was killed before her face. Julita of Cappadocia was a lady of distinguished capacity, great virtue, and uncommon courage. To complete the execution, Julita had boiling pitch poured on her feet her sides torn with hooks, and received the conclusion of her martyrdom by being beheaded, April the 16th, Anno Domini 305. Hermolaus, a venerable and pious Christian, at a great age, and an intimate acquaintance of Pantaleons, suffered martyrdom for the face on the same day, and in the same manner as Pantaleon. Oestratius, secretary to the governor of Armina, was thrown into fiery furnace, for exhorting some Christians who had been apprehended to persevere in their faith. Nicander and Marcion, 
two eminent Roman military officers were apprehended on account of their faith. As they were both men of great abilities in their profession, the utmost means were used to induce them to renounce Christianity. But these endeavors being found ineffectual, they were beheaded. In the kingdom of Naples, several martyrdoms took place, in particular, Januaries, Bishop of Beneventum, Socius, Diacon of Mycenae, Proculus, another Diacon, Oetuchis and Acutius, two laymen, Festus, a Diacon, and Desiderius, a reader, all on account of being Christians, were condemned by the governor of Campania to be devoured by his wild beasts. The savage animals, however, would not touch them, and so they were beheaded. Quirinus, bishop of Siscia, being carried before Matenius, the governor, was ordered to sacrifice to the pagan deities, agreeably to the edicts of various Roman emperors. The governor, perceiving his constancy, sent him to jail, and ordered him to be heavily ironed, flattering himself that the hardships of a jail, some occasional tortures, and the weight of chains, might overcome his resolution. Being decided in his principles, he was sent to Amantius, the principal governor of Pannonia, now Hungary, who loaded him with chains and carried him through the principal towns of the Danube, exposing him to ridicule wherever he went. Arriving at length at Sabaria, and finding that Quirinus would not renounce his faith, he ordered him to be cast into a river, with a stone fastened about his neck. The sentence being put into execution, Quirinus floated about for some time, and exhorting the people in the most pious terms, concluded his admonitions with this prayer. It is no new thing, O all-powerful Jesus, for thee to stop the course of rivers, or to cause a man to walk upon the water, as thou didst thy servant Peter. The people who have already seen the proof of thy power in me, grant me now to lay down my life for thy sake, O my God. On renouncing the last words, he immediately sank and died. June the 4th, Anno Domini, 308. His body was afterwards taken up and buried by some pious Christians. Pamphilus, a native of Phoenicia, of a considerable family, was a man of such extensive learning that he was called a second origin. He was received into the body of the clergy at Caesarea, where he established a public library and spent his time in the practice of every Christian virtue. He copied the greatest part of the works of origin with his own hand, and assisted by Eusebius, gave a correct copy of the Old Testament, which had suffered greatly by the ignorance or negligence of former transcribers. In the year 307, he was apprehended and suffered torture and martyrdom. Marcellus, bishop of Rome, being banished on account of his faith, fell a martyr to the miseries he suffered in exile, January the 16th, Anno Domini, 310. Peter, the 16th bishop of Alexandria, was martyred November 25th, Anno Domini, 311, by order of Maximus Caesar, who reigned in the East. Agnes, a virgin of only thirteen years of age, was beheaded for being a Christian, as was Cyrene, the empress of Dilgletian. Valentine, a priest, suffered the same fate at Rome, and Erasmus, a bishop, was martyred in Campania. Soon after this, the persecution abated in the middle parts of the empire, as well as in the west, and providence at length began to manifest vengeance on the persecutors. Maximian endeavoured to corrupt his daughter Fausta to murder Constantine, her husband, which she discovered, and Constantine forced him to choose his own death, when he preferred the ignominious death of hanging after being an emperor near twenty years. Constantine was the good and virtuous child of a good and virtuous father, born in Britain. His mother was named Helena, daughter of King Coelus. He was a most bountiful and gracious prince, having a desire to nourish learning and good arts, and did oftentimes used to read, write, and study himself. He had marvellous good success and prosperous achieving of all things he took in hand, which then was, and truly supposed to proceed of this, for that he was so great a favourer of the Christian faith, which faith when he had once embraced, he did ever after most devoutly and religiously reverence. Thus Constantine, 
sufficiently appointed with strength of men, but especially with strength of God, entered his journey coming towards Italy, which was about the last year of the persecution, Anno Domini 313. Maxentius, understanding of the coming of Constantine, and trusting more to his devilish art of magic than to the good will of his subjects, which he little deserved, durst not show himself out to the city, nor encounter him in the open field, but with privy garrisons laid wait for him by the way in sundry straits as he should come, with whom Constantine had diverse skirmishes, and by the power of the Lord did ever vanquish them and put them to flight. Notwithstanding, Constantine yet was in no great comfort, but in great care and dread in his mind, approaching now near unto Rome, for the magical charms and sorceries of Maxentius, wherewith he had vanquished before Severus, sent by Galerius against him. Therefore, being in great doubt and perplexity in himself, and revolving many things in his mind, what help he might have against the operations of his charming, Constantine, in his journey drawing towards the city, and casting up his eyes many times to heaven, in the south part, about the going down of the sun, saw a great brightness in heaven, appearing in the similitude of a cross, giving this inscription, in hoc vince, that is, in this hour come. Eusebius Pomphilus does witness that he had heard the said Constantine himself oftentimes report, and also to swear this to be true and certain, which he did see with his own eyes in heaven, and also his soldiers about him. At the sight whereof, when he was greatly astonished, and consulting with his men upon the meaning thereof, behold, in the night season in his sleep, Christ appeared to him with the sign of the same cross which he had seen before, bidding him to make the figuration thereof, and to carry it in his wars before him, and so should we have the victory. Constantine so established the peace of the church, that for the space of a thousand years we read of no set persecution against the Christians, and to the time of John Wycliffe. So happy, so glorious was this victory of Constantine, surnamed the Great. For the joy and gladness were all. The citizens who had sent for him before, with exceeding triumph, brought him into the city of Rome, where he was most honorably received, and celebrated the space of seven days together, having moreover in the market-place his image set up, holding in his right hand the sign of the cross, with this inscription, With this wholesome sign, the true token of fortitude, I have rescued and delivered our city from the yoke of the tyrant. We shall conclude our account of the tenth and last general persecution with the death of St. George, the titular saint and patron of England. St. George was born in Cappadocia of Christian parents, and giving proofs of his courage, was promoted in the army of the Emperor Diocletian. During the persecution, St. George threw up his command, went boldly to the Senate House, and avowed his being a Christian, taking occasion at the same time to remonstrate against paganism, and point out the absurdity of worshipping idols. This freedom so greatly provoked the Senate, that St. George was ordered to be tortured, and by the Emperor's orders was dragged through the streets, and beheaded the next day. The legend of the dragon, which is associated with this martyr, is usually illustrated by representing St. George, seated upon in charging horse, and transfixing the monster with his spear. This fiery dragon symbolizes the devil, who was vanquished by St. George's steadfast faith in Christ, which remained unshaken in spite of torture and death. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3, Part 1 a Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 3. Persecutions of the Christians in Persia. Part 1. The gospel having spread itself into Persia, the pagan priests who worshipped the sun were greatly alarmed, 
and dreaded the loss of that influence they had hitherto maintained over the people's minds and properties. Hence they thought it expedient to complain to the emperor that the Christians were enemies to the state, and held a treasonable correspondence with the Romans, the great enemies of Persia. The emperor, Sepores, being naturally averse to Christianity, easily believed what was said against the Christians, and gave orders to persecute them in all parts of his empire. On account of this mandate, many eminent persons in the church and state fell martyrs to the ignorance and ferocity of the pagans. Constantine the Great, being informed of the persecutions in Persia, wrote a long letter to the Persian monarch, in which he recounts the vengeance that had fallen on persecutors, and the great success that had attended those who had refrained from persecuting the Christians. Speaking of his victories over rival emperors of his own time, he said, I subdued these solely by faith in Christ, for which God was my helper, who gave me victory in battle, and made me triumph over my enemies. He hath likewise so enlarged to me the bounds of the Roman Empire, that it extends from the western ocean almost to the uttermost parts of the east. For this domain I neither offered sacrifices to the ancient deities, nor made use of charm or divination, but only offered up prayers to the Almighty God, and followed the cross of Christ. Rejoiced should I be if the throne of Persia found glory also by embracing the Christians, that so you with me, and they with you, may enjoy all happiness. In consequence of this appeal, the persecution ended for the time, but it was renewed in later years, when another king succeeded to the throne of Persia. Persecution under the Arian Heretics The author of the Arian Heresy was Arius, a native of Libya and a priest of Alexandria, who, in AD 318, began to publish his errors. He was condemned by a council of Libyan and Egyptian bishops, and that sentence was confirmed by the Council of Nicaea, AD 325. After the death of Constantine the Great, the Arians found means to ingratiate themselves into the favour of the Emperor Constantinus, his son and successor in the East, and hence a persecution was raised against the Orthodox bishops and clergy. The celebrated Athanasius and other bishops were banished and their sees filled with Arians. In Egypt and Libya, thirty bishops were martyred and many other Christians cruelly tormented, and A.D. 386, George the Arian, Bishop of Alexandria, under the authority of the Emperor, began a persecution in that city and its environs, and carried it on with the most infernal severity. He was assisted in his diabolical malice by Cataphonius, Governor of Egypt, Sebastian, General of the Egyptian Forces, Faustinus, the Treasurer, and Heraclius, a Roman officer. The persecutions now raged in such a manner that the clergy were driven from Alexandria, their churches were shut, and the severities practised by the Arian heretics were as great as those that had been practised by the pagan idolaters. If a man, accused of being a Christian, made his escape, then his whole family were massacred and his effects confiscated. Persecution under Julian the Apostate this emperor was the son of Julius Constantinus and the nephew of Constantine the Great. He studied the rudiments of grammar under the inspection of Mardonius, a eunuch, and a heathen of Constantinople. His father sent him some time after to Nicomedia to be instructed in the Christian religion by the bishop of Eusebius, his kinsman, but his principles were corrupted by the pernicious doctrines of Echebolius the rhetorician and Maximus the magician. Constantinus, dying the year 361, Julian succeeded him, and had no sooner attained the imperial dignity than he renounced Christianity and embraced paganism, which had for some years fallen into great disrepute. Though he restored the idolatrous worship, he made no public edicts against Christianity. He recalled all banished pagans, allowed the free exercise of religion to every sect, but deprived all Christians of officers at court, in the magistracy or in the army. He was chaste, temperate, vigilant, laborious and pious, 
yet he prohibited any Christian from keeping a school or public seminary of learning, and deprived all the Christian clergy of the privileges granted them by Constantine the Great. Bishop Basil made himself first famous by his opposition to Arianism, which brought upon him the vengeance of the Arian bishop of Constantinople. He equally opposed paganism. The emperor's agents in vain tampered with Basil by means of promises, threats, and racks. He was firm in the faith, and remained in prison to undergo some other sufferings, when the emperor came accidentally to Ancyra. Julian determined to examine Basil himself, when that holy man, being brought before him, the emperor did everything in his power to dissuade him from persevering in the faith. Basil not only continued as firm as ever, but with a prophetic spirit foretold the death of the emperor, and that he should be tormented in the other life. Enraged at what he heard, Julian commanded that the body of Basil should be torn every day in seven different parts, until his skin and flesh were entirely mangled. This inhuman sentence was executed with rigour, and the martyr expired under its severities on June 28, A.D. 362. Donatus, Bishop of Arezzo, and Hilarinus, a hermit, suffered about the same time. Also Gordian, a Roman magistrate, Artemius, commander-in-chief of the Roman forces in Egypt, being a Christian, was deprived of his commission, then of his estate, and lastly of his head. The persecution raged dreadfully about the latter end of the year 363, but as many of the particulars have not been handed down to us, it is necessary to remark in general that in Palestine many were burnt alive, others were dragged by their feet through the streets naked until they expired, some were scalded to death, many stoned, and great numbers had their brains beaten out with clubs. In Alexandria innumerable were the martyrs who suffered by the sword, burning, crucifixion, and stoning. In Arethusa, several were ripped open, and corn being put into their bellies, swine were brought to feed therein, which, in devouring the grain, likewise devoured the entrails of the martyrs. And, in Thrace, Emilianus was burnt at a stake, and Domitius murdered in a cave, whither he had fled for refuge. The emperor, Julian the Apostate, died of a wound which he received in his Persian expedition, A.D. 363, and even while expiring uttered the most horrid blasphemies. He was succeeded by Jovian, who restored peace to the church. After the decease of Jovian, Valentinian succeeded to the empire, and associated to himself Valens, who had the command in the east, and was an Arian, and of an unrelenting and persecuting disposition. Persecution of the Christians by the Goths and Vandals Many Scythian Goths, having embraced Christianity about the time of Constantine the Great, the light of the gospel spread itself considerably in Scythia, through the two kings who ruled that country, and the majority of the people continued pagans. Fritigern, king of the West Goths, was an ally to the Romans, but Athanaric, king of the East Goths, was at war with them. The Christians, in the dominions of the former, lived unmolested, but the latter, having been defeated by the Romans, wreaked his vengeance on his Christian subjects, commencing his pagan injunction in the year 370. In religion, the Goths were Arians and called themselves Christians. Therefore they destroyed all the statues and temples of the heathen gods, but did no harm to the orthodox Christian churches. Alaric had all the qualities of a great general. To the wild bravery of the Gothic barbarian, he added the courage and skill of the Roman soldier. He led his forces across the Alps into Italy, and, although driven back for the time, returned afterward with an irresistible force. The Last Roman Triumph After this fortunate victory over the Goths, a triumph, as it was called, was celebrated at Rome. For hundreds of years successful generals had been awarded this great honour on their return from a victorious campaign. Upon such occasions the city was given up for days to the marching of troops laden with spoils, and who dragged after them prisoners of war, among whom were often captive kings and conquered generals. 
This was to be the last Roman triumph, for it celebrated the last Roman victory. Although it had been won by Stilicho, the general, it was the boy emperor, Honorius, who took the credit, entering Rome in the car of victory, and driving to the capital, amid the shouts of the populace. Afterward, as was customary on such occasions, there were bloody combats in the Colosseum, where gladiators, armed with swords and spears, fought as furiously as if they were on the field of battle. The first part of the bloody entertainment was finished. The bodies of the dead were dragged off with hooks, and the red and sand covered with a fresh, clean layer. After this had been done, the gates in the wall of the arena were thrown open, and a number of tall, well-formed men in the prime of youth and strength came forward. Some carried swords, others three-pronged spears and nets. They marched once around the walls, and stopping before the emperor, held up their weapons at arm's length, and, with one voice, sounded out their greeting. Ave Caesar, morituri et salutant. Hail Caesar, those about to die salute thee. The combats now began again. The gladiators with nets tried to entangle those with swords, and when they succeeded, mercilessly stabbed their antagonists to death with the three-pronged spear. When a gladiator had wounded his adversary, and had him lying helpless at his feet, he looked up at the eager faces of the spectators, and cried out, Hoc habet! He has it, and awaited the pleasure of the audience to kill or spare. If the spectators held out their hands toward him with thumbs upward, the defeated man was taken away to recover, if possible, from his wounds. But if the fatal signal of thumbs down was given, the conquered was to be slain, and if he showed any reluctance to present his neck for the death blow, there was a scornful shout from the galleries, Rakipa ferum, receive the steel. Privileged persons among the audience would even descend into the arena to better witness the death agonies of some unusually brave victim before his corpse was dragged out at the death gate. The show went on, many had been slain, and the people, madly excited by the desperate bravery of those who continued to fight, shouted their applause. But suddenly there was an interruption. A rudely clad, robed figure appeared for a moment among the audience, and then boldly leaped down into the arena. He was seen to be a man of rough but imposing presence, bareheaded and with sun-browned face. Without hesitating an instant, he advanced upon two gladiators engaged in a life-and-death struggle, and laying his hand upon one of them, sternly reproved him for shedding innocent blood, and then, turning toward the thousands of angry faces ranged around him, called upon them in a solemn, deep-toned voice which resounded through the deep enclosure. These were his words. Do not requite God's mercy in turning away the swords of your enemies by murdering each other. Angry shouts and cries at once drowned his voice. This is no place for preaching. The old customs of Rome must be observed. On, gladiators! Thrusting aside the stranger, the gladiators would have again attacked each other, but the man stood between, holding them apart, trying in vain to be heard. Sedition! Sedition! Down with him! was then the cry, and the gladiators, enraged at the interference of an outsider with their chosen vocation, at once stabbed him to death. Stones, or whatever missiles came to hand, also rained down upon him from the furious people, and thus he perished in the midst of the arena. His dress showed him to be one of the hermits who vowed themselves to a holy life of prayer and self-denial, and who were reverenced by even the thoughtless and combat-loving Romans. The few who knew him told how he had come from the wilds of Asia on a pilgrimage to visit the churches and keep his Christmas at Rome. They knew he was a holy man, that his name was Telemachus, no more. His spirit had been stirred by the sight of thousands flocking to see men slaughter one another, and in his simple-hearted zeal he had tried to convince them of the cruelty and wickedness of their conduct. He had died, but not in vain. His work was accomplished at the moment he was struck down, for the shock of such a death before their eyes turned the hearts of the people. They saw the hideous aspects of the favourite vice to which they had 
blindly surrendered themselves, and from the day Telemachus fell dead in the Colosseum, no other fight of gladiators was ever held there. End of chapter 2, part 1. Recording by Jordan. Chapter 3, part 2 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Fox's Book of Martyrs, volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 3. Persecutions of the Christians in Persia. Part 2. Persecutions from about the middle of the 5th to the conclusion of the 7th century. Proterius was made a priest by Cyril, bishop of Alexandria, who was well acquainted with his virtues, before he appointed him to preach. On the death of Cyril, the See of Alexandria was filled by Discorus, an inveterate enemy to the memory and family of his predecessor. Being condemned by the council of Chalcedon for having embraced the errors of Eutyches, he was deposed, and Proterius chosen to fill the vacant see, who was approved of by the emperor. This occasioned a dangerous insurrection, for the city of Alexandria was divided into two factions the one to espouse the cause of the old, and the other of the new prelate. In one of the commotions, the Eutychians determined to wreak their vengeance on Proterius, who fled to the church for sanctuary. But on Good Friday, A.D. 457, a large body of them rushed into the church and barbarously murdered the prelate, after which they dragged the body through the streets, insulted it, cut it to pieces, burnt it, and scattered the ashes in the air. Hermenegildus, a Gothic prince, was the eldest son of Leo Vigildus, a king of the Goths in Spain. This prince, who was originally an Arian, became a convert to the Orthodox faith by means of his wife, Ingonda. When the king heard that his son had changed his religious sentiments, he stripped him of the command at Seville, where he was governor, and threatened to put him to death unless he renounced the faith he had newly embraced. The prince, in order to prevent the execution of his father's menaces, began to put himself into a posture of defense, and many of the orthodox persuasion in Spain declared for him. The king, exasperated at this act of rebellion, began to punish all the Orthodox Christians who could be seized by his troops, and thus a very severe persecution commenced. He likewise marched against his son at the head of a very powerful army. The prince took refuge in Seville, from which he fled, and was at length besieged and taken at Asieta. Loaded with chains, he was sent to Seville, and at the Feast of Easter, Refusing to receive the Eucharist from an Arian bishop, the enraged king ordered his guards to cut the prince to pieces, which they punctually performed April 13th, A.D. 586. Martin, bishop of Rome, was born at Tadi in Italy. He was naturally inclined to virtue, and his parents bestowed on him an admirable education. He opposed the heretics, called Monothelites, who were patronized by the emperor Heraclius. Martin was condemned at Constantinople, where he was exposed in the most public places to the ridicule of the people, divested of all episcopal marks of distinction, and treated with the greatest scorn and severity. After lying some months in prison, Martin was sent to an island at some distance, and there cut to pieces. A.D. 655. John Bishop of Bergamo in Lombardy, was a learned man and a good Christian. He did his utmost endeavors to clear the church from the errors of Arianism, and joining in this holy work with John, Bishop of Milan, 
he was very successful against the heretics, on which account he was assassinated on July 11th, A.D. 683. Killian was born in Ireland, and received from his parents a pious and Christian education. He obtained the Roman pontiff's license to preach to the pagans in Franconia in Germany. At Würzburg he converted Gosbert, the governor, whose example was followed by the greater part of the people in two years after. Persuading Gosbert that his marriage with his brother's widow was sinful, the latter had him beheaded, A.D. 689. Persecutions from the early part of the 8th to near the conclusion of the 10th century. Boniface, Archbishop of Mentz, and father of the German Church, was an Englishman, and is, in ecclesiastical history, looked upon as one of the brightest ornaments of this nation. Originally his name was Winifred, or Winfrith, and he was born at Curtin, in Devonshire, then part of the West Saxon kingdom. When he was only about six years of age, he began to discover a propensity to reflection, and seemed solicitous to gain information on religious subjects. Wolfrod, the abbot, finding that he possessed a bright genius as well as a strong inclination to study, had him removed to Nutschel, a seminary of learning in the diocese of Winchester, where he would have a much greater opportunity of attaining improvements than at Exeter. After due study, the abbot, seeing him qualified for the priesthood, obliged him to receive that holy order when he was about thirty years old from which time he began to preach and labor for the salvation of his fellow creatures. He was released to attend a synod of bishops in the kingdom of West Saxons. He afterwards, in 719, went to Rome, where Gregory the Second, who then sat in Peter's chair, received him with great friendship, and finding him full of all virtues that composed the character of an apostolic missionary, dismissed him without commission at large, to preach the gospel to the pagans, wherever he found them. Passing through Lombardy and Bavaria, he came to Thuringia, which country had before received the light of the gospel. He next visited Utrecht, and then proceeded to Saxony, where he converted some thousands to Christianity. During the ministry of this meek prelate, Pepin was declared king of France. It was that prince's ambition to be crowned by the most holy prelate he could find, and Boniface was pitched on to perform that ceremony, which he did at Soissons in 752. The next year his great age and many infirmities lay so heavy on him that, with the consent of the new king and the bishops of his diocese, he consecrated Lullus, his countryman and faithful disciple, and placed him in the Sea of Mentz. When he had thus eased himself of his charge, he recommended the Church of Mentz to the care of the new bishop in very strong terms, desired he would finish the church at Fuld, and see him buried in it, for his end was near. Having left these orders, he took boat to the Rhine, and went to Friesland, where he converted and baptized several thousands of barbarous natives, demolished the temples, and raised churches on the ruins of those superstitious structures. A day being appointed for confirming a great number of new converts, he ordered them to assemble in a new open plain near the river Bourd. Thither he repaired the day before, and, pitching a tent, determined to remain on the spot all night in order to be ready early in the morning. Some pagans, who were his inveterate enemies, having intelligence of this, poured down upon him and the companions of his mission in the night, and killed him and fifty-two of his companions and attendants on June 5th, A.D. 755. Thus fell the great father of the Germanic Church, the honor of England, and the glory of the age in which he lived. Forty-two persons of Armorian in Upper Frisia were martyred in the year 845, by the Saracens, the circumstances of which transactions are as follows. In the reign of Theophilus, 
the Saracens ravaged many parts of the Eastern Empire, gained several considerable advantages over the Christians, took the city of Armorian, and numbers suffered martyrdom. Flora and Mary, two ladies of distinction, suffered martyrdom at the same time. Perfectus was born at Corduba in Spain, and brought up in the Christian faith. Having a quick genius, he made himself master of all the useful and polite literature of that age, and at the same time was not more celebrated for his abilities than admired for his piety. At length he took priest's orders, and performed the duties of his office with great assiduity and punctuality. Publicly declaring Mohammed an impostor, he was sentenced to be beheaded, and was accordingly executed, A.D. 850, after which his body was honorably interred by the Christians. Adalbert, Bishop of Prague, a Bohemian by birth, after being involved in many troubles, began to direct his thoughts to the conversion of the infidels, to which end he repaired to Danzig, where he converted and baptized many, which so enraged the pagan priests that they fell upon him and dispatched him with darts on April 23, A.D. 997. Persecutions in the Eleventh Century Alphage, Archbishop of Canterbury, was descended from a considerable family in Gloucestershire and received an education suitable to his illustrious birth. His parents were worthy Christians, and Alphage seemed to inherit their virtues. The see of Winchester being vacant by the death of Ethelwold, Dunstan, Archbishop of Canterbury, as primate of all England, consecrated Alphage to the vacant bishopric, to the general satisfaction of all concerned in the diocese. Dunstan had an extraordinary veneration for Alphage, and when at the point of death made it his ardent request to God that he might succeed him in the see of Canterbury, which accordingly happened, though not until about eighteen years after Dunstan's death, in 1006. After Alphage had governed the see of Canterbury about four years, with great reputation to himself and benefit to his people, the Danes made an incursion into England and laid siege to Canterbury. When the design of attacking this city was known, many of the principal people made a flight from it, and would have persuaded Alphage to follow their example. But he, like a good pastor, would not listen to such a proposal. While he was employed in assisting and encouraging the people, Canterbury was taken by storm. The enemy poured into the town, and destroyed all that came in their way by fire and sword. He had the courage to address the enemy, and offer himself to their swords as more worthy of their rage than the people. He begged they might be saved, and that they would discharge their whole fury upon him. They accordingly seized him, tied his hands, insulted and abused him in a rude and barbarous manner, and obliged him to remain on the spot until his church was burnt and the monks massacred. They then decimated all the inhabitants, both ecclesiastics and laymen, leaving only every tenth person alive, so that they put 7,236 persons to death, and left only four monks and 800 laymen alive, after which they confined the archbishop in a dungeon, where they kept him close prisoner for several months. During his confinement they proposed to him to redeem his liberty with the sum of three thousand pounds, and to persuade the king to purchase their departure out of the kingdom with a further sum of ten thousand pounds. As Alphage's circumstances would not allow him to satisfy the exorbitant demand, they bound him, and put him to severe torments, to oblige him to discover the treasure of the church, upon which they assured him of his life and liberty but the prelate piously persisted in refusing to give the pagans any account of it. They remanded him to prison again, confined him six days longer, and then, taking him prisoner with them to Greenwich, brought him to trial there. He still remained inflexible with respect to the church treasure, but exhorted them to forsake their idolatry 
and embrace Christianity. This so greatly incensed the Danes, that the soldiers dragged him out of the camp and beat him unmercifully. One of the soldiers who had been converted by him, knowing that his pains would be lingering, as his death was determined on, actuated by a kind of barbarous compassion, cut off his head, and thus put the finishing stroke to his martyrdom, April 19th, A.D. 1012. This transaction happened on the very spot where the church at Greenwich, which is dedicated to him, now stands. After his death, his body was thrown into the Thames, but being found the next day, it was buried in the Cathedral of St. Paul's by the bishops of London and Lincoln, from whence it was, in 1023, removed to Canterbury by Ethelmoth, the archbishop of that province. Gerard, a Venetian, devoted himself to the service of God from his tender years, entered into a religious house for some time, and then determined to visit the Holy Land. Going into Hungary, he became acquainted with Stephen, the king of that country, who made him bishop of Chonad. Uvo and Peter, successors of Stephen, being deposed, Andrew, son of Ladislaus, cousin German to Stephen, had then a tender of the crown made him upon condition that he would employ his authority in extirpating the Christian religion out of Hungary. The ambitious prince came into the proposal, but Gerard, being informed of his impious bargain, thought it his duty to remonstrate against the enormity of Andrew's crime, and persuade him to withdraw his promise. In this view he undertook to go to that prince, attended by three prelates, full of like zeal for religion. The new king was at Alba Regales, but, as the four bishops were going to cross the Danube, they were stopped by a party of soldiers posted there. They bore an attack of a shower of stones patiently, when the soldiers beat them unmercifully, and at length dispatched them with lances. Their martyrdoms happened in the year 1045. Stanislaus, Bishop of Krakow, was descended from an illustrious Polish family. The piety of his parents was equal to their opulence, and the latter they rendered subservient to all the purposes of charity and benevolence. Stanislaus remained for some time undetermined whether he should embrace a monastic life or engage among the secular clergy. He was at length persuaded to the latter by Lambert Zula, Bishop of Krakow, who gave him holy orders, and made him a canon of his cathedral. Lambert died on November 25, 1071, when all concerned in the choice of a successor declared for Stanislaus, and he succeeded to the prelacy. Boleslaus, the second king of Poland, had by nature many good qualities, but giving away to his passions, he ran into many enormities, and at length had the appellation of cruel bestowed upon him. Stanislaus alone had the courage to tell him of his faults, when, taking a private opportunity, he freely displayed to him the enormities of his crimes. The king, greatly exasperated at his repeated freedoms, at length determined at any rate to get the better of a prelate who was so extremely faithful. Hearing one day that the bishop was by himself in the chapel of St. Michael, at a small distance from the town, he dispatched some soldiers to murder him. The soldiers readily undertook the bloody task, but when they came into the presence of Stanislaus, the venerable aspect of the prelate struck them with such awe that they could not perform what they had promised. On their return, the king, finding that they had not obeyed his orders, stormed at them violently, snatched a dagger from one of them, and ran furiously to the chapel where, finding Stanislaus at the altar, he plunged the weapon into his heart. The prelate immediately expired on May 8, A.D. 1079. End of chapter 3 Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan D-R-Z-E-I-L-E -E dot net Chapter 4, Part 1 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 4 Papal Persecutions, Part 1. Thus far, our history of persecution has been confined principally to the pagan world. We come now to a period when persecution, under the guise of Christianity, committed more enormities than ever disgraced the annals of paganism. Disregarding the maxims and the spirit of the gospel, the papal church, arming herself with the power of the sword, vexed the church of God and wasted it for several centuries a period most appropriately termed in history the Dark Ages. The kings of the earth gave their power to the beast, and submitted to be trodden on by the miserable vermin that often filled the papal chair, as in the case of Henry, emperor of Germany. The storm of papal persecution first burst upon the Waldenses in France. Persecution of the Waldenses in France Popery having brought various innovations into the church, and overspread the Christian world with darkness and superstition, some few, who plainly perceived the pernicious tendency of such errors, determined to show the light of the gospel in its real purity, and to disperse those clouds which artful priests had raised about it, in order to blind the people and obscure its real brightness. The principal among these was Berengarius, who, about the year 1000, boldly preached gospel truths, according to their primitive purity. Many, from conviction, assented to his doctrine, and were, on that account, called Berengarians. To Berengarius succeeded Pierre Bruis, who preached at Toulouse, under the protection of an earl named Hildelphonsus, and the whole tenets of the reformers, with the reasons of their separation from the Church of Rome, were published in a book written by Bruis under the title of Antichrist. By the year of Christ 1140, the number of the Reformed was very great, and the probability of its increasing alarmed the Pope, who wrote to several princes to banish them from their dominions, and employed many learned men to write against their doctrines. In A.D. 1147, because of Henry of Toulouse, deemed their most eminent preacher, they were called Hinertians, and as they would not admit of any proofs relative to religion, but what could be deduced from the scriptures themselves, the popish party gave them the name of Apostolics. At length, Peter Waldo, or Valdo, a native of Lyon, eminent for his piety and learning, became a strenuous opposer of popery, and from him the Reformed, at that time, received the appellation of Waldenses, or Waldois. Pope Alexander the Third, being informed by the Bishop of Lyon of these transactions, excommunicated Waldo and his adherents, and commanded the bishop to exterminate them, if possible, from the face of the earth. Hence began the papal persecutions against the Waldenses. The proceedings of Waldo and the Reformed occasioned the first rise of the Inquisitors, for Pope Innocent the Third authorized certain monks as inquisitors to inquire for and deliver over the reformed to the secular power. The process was short, as an accusation was deemed adequate to guilt, and a candid trial was never granted to the accused. The Pope, finding that these cruel means had not the intended effect, sent several learned monks to preach among the Waldenses, and to endeavor to argue them out of their opinions. Among these monks was one Dominic, who appeared extremely zealous in the cause of popery. This Dominic instituted an order, which, from him, was called the Order of Dominican Friars, and the members of this order have ever since been the principal inquisitors in the various inquisitions in the world. The power of the inquisitors was unlimited. They proceeded against whom they pleased, without any consideration of age, sex, or rank. Let the accusers be ever so infamous, the accusation was deemed valid, and even anonymous informations, sent by letter, 
were thought sufficient evidence. To be rich was a crime equal to heresy. Therefore, many who had money were accused of heresy, or of being favorers of heretics, that they might be obliged to pay for their opinions. The dearest friends or nearest kindred could not, without danger, serve any one who was imprisoned on account of religion. To convey to those who were confined a little straw, or give them a cup of water, was called favoring of the heretics, and they were prosecuted accordingly. No lawyer dared to plead for his own brother, and their malice even extended beyond the grave. Hence the bones of many were dug up and burnt as examples to the living. If a man on his deathbed was accused of being a follower of Waldo, his estates were confiscated, and the heir to them defrauded of his inheritance, and some were sent to the Holy Land, while the Dominicans took possession of their houses and properties, and, when the owners returned, would often pretend not to know them. These persecutions were continued for several centuries under different popes and other great dignitaries of the Catholic Church. End of chapter 4, part 1 Recording by Sean F. Sawyers, O'Fallon, Missouri Chapter 4, Part 2 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 4, Papal Persecutions, Part 2 persecutions of the Albigenses. The Albigenses were a people of the reformed religion who inhabited the country of Albi. They were condemned on the score of religion in the Council of Lateran by order of Pope Alexander the Third. Nevertheless, they increased so prodigiously that many cities were inhabited by persons only of their persuasion, and several eminent noblemen embraced their doctrines. Among the latter were Raymond, Earl of Toulouse, Raymond, Earl of Foix, the Earl of Beziers, etc. A friar named Peter, having been murdered in the dominions of the Earl of Toulouse, the Pope made the murder a pretense to persecute that nobleman and his subjects. To effect this, he sent persons throughout all Europe, in order to raise forces to act coercively against the Albigenses, and promised paradise to all that would come to this war which he termed a holy war, and bear arms for forty days. The same indulgences were likewise held out to all who entered themselves for the purpose as to such as engaged in crusades to the Holy Land. The brave earl defended Toulouse and other places with the most heroic bravery and various success against the Pope's legates and Simon, Earl of Montfort, a bigoted Catholic nobleman. Unable to subdue the Earl of Toulouse openly, the King of France, and the Queen Mother, and three archbishops raised another formidable army, and had the art to persuade the Earl of Toulouse to come to a conference, when he was treacherously seized upon, made a prisoner, forced to appear barefooted and bareheaded before his enemies, and compelled to subscribe an abject recantation. This was followed by a severe persecution against the Albigenses, and express orders that the laity should not be permitted to read the sacred scriptures. In the year 1620 also, the persecution against the Albigenses was very severe. In 1648, a heavy persecution raged throughout Lithuania and Poland. The cruelty of the Cossacks was so excessive that the Tartans themselves were ashamed of their barbarities. Among others who suffered was the Reverend Adrian Cholinsky, who was roasted alive by a slow fire, and whose sufferings and mode of death may depict the horrors which the professors of Christianity have endured from the enemies of the Redeemer. The reformation of papistical error very early was projected in France. For in the third century a learned man named Almericus and six of his disciples were ordered to be burnt at Paris for asserting that God was no otherwise present in the sacramental bread than in any other bread. 
that it was idolatry to build altars or shrines to saints, and that it was ridiculous to offer incense to them. The martyrdom of Almericus and his pupils did not, however, prevent many from acknowledging the justness of his notions, and seeing the purity of the reformed religion, so that the faith of Christ continually increased, and in time not only spread itself over many parts of France, but diffused the light of the gospel over various other countries. In the year 1524, at a town in France called Meldon, one John Clark set up a bill on the church door, wherein he called the Pope Antichrist. For this offense, he was repeatedly whipped, and then branded on the forehead. Going afterward to Mentz in Lorraine, he demolished some images for which he had his right hand and nose cut off, and his arms and breast torn with pinchers. He sustained these cruelties with amazing fortitude, and was even sufficiently cool to sing the one hundredth and fifteenth psalm, which expressly forbids idolatry, after which he was thrown into the fire and burnt to ashes. Many persons of the reformed persuasion were, about this time, beaten, racked, scourged, and burnt to death, in several parts of France, but more particularly at Paris, Malda, and Lamassan. A native of Malda was burnt by a slow fire, for saying that Mass was a plain denial of the death and passion of Christ. At Lamassan, John de Cardurco, a clergyman of the reformed religion, was apprehended and ordered to be burnt. Francis Brevard, secretary to Cardinal de Palais, for speaking in favor of the Reformed, had his tongue cut out, and was then burnt. A.D. 1545. James Cobard, a schoolmaster in the city of St. Michael, was burnt. A.D. 1545. For saying that, quote, the Mass was useless and absurd. And about the same time, fourteen men were burnt at Malda their wives being compelled to stand by and behold the execution. A.D. 1546, Peter Chapot brought a number of Bibles in the French tongue to France, and publicly sold them there, for which he was brought to trial, sentenced, and executed a few days afterwards. Soon after, a cripple of Meaux, a schoolmaster of Farah, named Stephen Pollat, and a man named John English were burnt for the faith. Monsieur Blondel, a rich jeweler, was, in A.D. 1548, apprehended at Lyons and sent to Paris. There he was burnt for the faith by order of the court. A.D. 1549. Herbert, a youth of nineteen years of age, was committed to the flames at Dijon, as was also Florent Venot in the same year. In the year 1554, Two men of the Reformed religion, with the son and daughter of one of them, were apprehended and committed to the castle of Nivern. On examination, they confessed their faith and were ordered to execution. Being smeared with grease, brimstone, and gunpowder, they cried, Salt on! Salt on this sinful and rotten flesh! Their tongues were then cut out, and they were afterward committed to the flames, which soon consumed them by means of the combustible matter with which they were besmeared. The Bartholomew Massacre at Paris, etc. On the twenty-second day of August, 1572, commenced this diabolical act of sanguinary brutality. It was intended to destroy at one stroke the root of the Protestant tree, which had only before partially suffered in its branches the king of france had artfully proposed a marriage between his sister and the prince of navarre the captain and prince of the protestants this imprudent marriage was publicly celebrated at paris august eighteen by the cardinal of bourbon upon a high stage erected for the purpose they dined in great pomp with the bishop and supped with the king at paris four days after this the prince coligny as he was coming from the council was shot in both arms. He then said to Mar, his deceased mother's minister, O my brother, I do now perceive that I am indeed beloved of my God, since for his most holy sake I am wounded. Although the vidam advised him to fly, yet he abode in Paris, and was soon after slain by Bemgis, who afterward declared he never saw a man meet death more valiantly than the admiral. The soldiers were appointed at a certain signal to burst out instantly to the slaughter in all parts of the city. 
when they had killed the admiral they threw him out at a window in the street where his head was cut off and sent to the pope the savage papists still raging against him cut off his arms and private members and after dragging him three days through the streets hung him by the heels without the city after him they slew many great and honorable persons who were protestants as count rochefoucault tolenius the admiral's son-in-law antonius clermontus marquis of ravelle Luz, Bussius, brandinius Publius, Bernaeus, etc., and falling upon the common people, they continued the slaughter for many days. In the three first they slew of all ranks and conditions to the number of ten thousand. The bodies were thrown into the rivers, and blood ran through the streets with a strong current, and the river appeared presently like a stream of blood. So furious was their hellish rage that they slew all papists whom they suspected to be not very staunch to their diabolical religion. From Paris the destruction spread to all quarters of the realm. At Orleans a thousand were slain of men, women, and children, and six thousand at Rouen. At Meldith two hundred were put into prison, and later brought out by units and cruelly murdered. At Lyons eight hundred were massacred here children hanging about their parents and parents affectionately embracing their children were pleasant food for the swords and bloodthirsty minds of those who call themselves the catholic church here three hundred were slain in the bishop's house and the impious monks would suffer none to be buried at augustabana on the people hearing of the massacre at paris they shut their gates that no protestants might escape and searching diligently for every individual of the reformed church imprisoned and then barbarously murdered them the same cruelty they practised at avarcum and troyes at toulouse rouen and many other places running from city to city towns and villages through the kingdom as a corroboration of this horrid carnage the following interesting narrative written by a sensible and learned roman catholic appears in this place with peculiar propriety. The nuptials, says he, of the young king of Navarre with the French king's sister was solemnized with pomp, and all the endearments, all the assurances of friendship, all the oaths sacred among men were profusely lavished by Catherine, the queen mother, and by the king, during which the rest of the court thought of nothing but festivities, plays, and masquerades. At last, at twelve o'clock at night, on the eve of St. Bartholomew, the signal was given. Immediately all the houses of the Protestants were forced open at once. Admiral Coligny, alarmed by the uproar, jumped out of bed, when a company of assassins rushed in his chamber. They were headed by one Vesem, who had been bred up as a domestic in the family of the Guises. This wretch thrust his sword into the Admiral's breast, and also cut him in the face. But Sam was a German, and being afterwards taken by the Protestants, the Rochelers would have brought him in order to hang and quarter him. But he was killed by one Bretonville. Henry, the young Duke of Guise, who afterwards framed the Catholic League, and was murdered at Bloss, standing at the door until the horrid butchery should be completed, called aloud, But Sam, is it done? Immediately after this, the ruffians threw the body out of the window, and Coligny expired at Guise's feet. Count de Teligny also fell a sacrifice. He had married, about ten months before, Coligny's daughter. His countenance was so engaging that the ruffians, when they advanced in order to kill him, were struck with compassion. But others, more barbarous, rushing forward, murdered him. In the meantime, all the friends of Coligny were assassinated throughout Paris. Men, women, and children were promiscuously slaughtered, and every street was strewed with expiring bodies. Some priests, holding up a crucifix in one hand and a dagger in the other, ran to the chiefs of the murderers and strongly exhorted them to spare neither relations nor friends. Tavans, Marshal of France, an ignorant, superstitious soldier, who joined the fury of religion to the rage of party, rode on horseback through the streets of Paris, crying to his men, Let blood! Let blood! Bleeding is as wholesome in August as in May. 
in the memories of the life of this enthusiastic written by his son we are told that the father being on his deathbed and making a general confession of his actions the priest said to him with surprise what no mention of st bartholomew's massacre to which tavans replied i consider it as a meritorious action that will wash away my sins such horrid sentiments can a false spirit of religion inspire the king's palace was one of the chief scenes of the butchery the king of navarre had his lodgings in the louvre and all his domestics were protestants many of these were killed in bed with their wives others running away naked were pursued by the soldiers through the several rooms of the palace even to the king's antechamber the young wife of henry of navarre awakened by the dreadful uproar being afraid for her consort and for her own life seized with horror and half dead flew from her bed in order to throw herself at the feet of the king her brother but scarce had she opened her chamber door when some of her protestant domestics rushed in for refuge the soldiers immediately followed pursued them in sight of the princess and killed one who crept under her bed two others being wounded with halberds fell at the queen's feet so that she was covered with blood count de la rochefoucauld a young nobleman greatly in the king's favor for his comely air his politeness and a certain peculiar happiness in the turn of his conversation had spent the evening until eleven o'clock with the monarch in pleasant familiarity and had given a loose with the utmost mirth to the sallies of his imagination the monarch felt some remorse and being touched with a kind of compassion bid him two or three times not to go home but lie in the louvre the count said he must go to his wife upon which the king pressed him no farther but said let him go i see god has decreed his death and in two hours after he was murdered very few of the protestants escaped the fury of their enthusiastic persecutors among these was young le force afterwards the famous marshal de la force a child about ten years of age whose deliverance was exceedingly remarkable his father the elder brother and he himself were seized together by the duke of anjou's soldier these murderers flew at all three and struck them at random when they all fell and lay upon one another the youngest did not receive a single blow but appearing as if he was dead escaped the next day and his life thus wonderfully preserved lasted fourscore and five years many of the wretched victims fled to the waterside and some swam over the Seine to the suburbs of st germain the king saw them from his window which looked upon the river and fired upon them with a carbine that had been loaded for that purpose by one of his pages while the queen mother undisturbed and serene in the midst of slaughter looking down from a balcony encouraged the murderers and laughed at the dying groans of the slaughtered this barbarous queen was fired with a restless ambition and she perpetually shifted her party in order to satiate it some days after this horrid transaction the french court endeavored to palliate it by forms of law they pretended to justify the massacre by a calumny and accused the admiral of a conspiracy which no one believed the parliament was commended to proceed against the memory of coligny and his dead body was hanged in chains on Montfaucon gallows the king himself went to view this shocking spectacle so one of his courtiers advised him to retire and complaining of the stench of the corpse he replied a dead enemy smells well the massacres on st bartholomew's day are painted in the royal salon of the vatican at rome with the following inscription pontifex coligny necem probet i e the pope approves of coligny's death the young king of navarre was spared through policy rather than from pity of the queen mother she keeping him prisoner until the king's death in order that he might be as a security and pledge for the submission of such protestants as might effect their escape this horrid butchery was not confined merely to the city of paris the like orders were issued from court to the governors of all the provinces in france so that in a week's time about one hundred thousand protestants were cut to pieces in different parts of the kingdom
Two or three governors only refused to obey the king's orders. One of these, named Montmorin, governor of Auvergne, wrote the king the following letter, which deserves to be transmitted to the latest posterity. Sire, I have received an order, under your majesty's seal, to put to death all the Protestants in my province. I have too much respect for your majesty not to believe the letter of forgery. But if, which God forbid, the order should be genuine, I have too much respect for your majesty to obey it. At Rome, the horrid joy was so great that they appointed a day of high festival and a jubilee with great indulgence to all who kept it and showed every expression of gladness they could devise and the man who first carried the news received a thousand crowns of the cardinal of lorraine for his ungodly message the king also commanded the day to be kept with every demonstration of joy concluding now that the whole race of huguenots was extinct many who gave great sums of money for their ransom were immediately after slain and several towns which were under the king's promise of protection and safety were cut off as soon as they delivered themselves up on these promises to his generals or captains at bordeaux at the instigation of a villainous monk who used to urge the papists to slaughter in his sermons two hundred and sixty-four were cruelly murdered some of them senators another of the same pious fraternity produced a similar slaughter at angenicum in maine where the populace at the holy inquisitor's satanical suggestion ran upon the protestants slew them plundered their houses and pulled down their church the duke of guise entered into Blois, suffered his soldiers to fly upon the spoil and slay or drown all the protestants they could find in this they spared neither age nor sex defiling the women and then murdering them from whence he went to mare and committed the same outrages for many days together here they found a minister named cassabonius and threw him into the river at anjou they slew albiacus a minister and many women were defiled and murdered there among whom were two sisters abused before their father whom the assassins bound to a wall to see them and then slew them and him the president of turin after giving a large sum for his life was cruelly beaten with clubs stripped of his clothes and hung feet upwards with his head and breast in the river before he was dead they opened his belly plucked out his entrails and threw them into the river and then carried his heart about the city upon a spear at barre great cruelty was used even to young children whom they cut open pulled out their entrails which through very rage they gnawed with their teeth those who had fled to the castle when they yielded were almost hanged thus they did at the city of mastacon counting it sport to cut off their arms and legs and afterward kill them and for the entertainment of their visitors they often threw the protestants from a high bridge into the river saying did you ever see men leap so well at penna after promising them safety three hundred were inhumanely butchered and five and forty at albia on the lord's day at non though it yielded on conditions of safeguard the most horrid spectacles were exhibited persons of both sexes and conditions were indiscriminately murdered the streets ringing with doleful cries and flowing with blood and the houses flaming with fire which the abandoned soldiers had thrown in one woman being dragged from her hiding place with her husband was first abused by the brutal soldiers and then with the sword which they commanded her to draw they forced it while in her hands into the bowels of her husband at samarrow bridge they murdered above one hundred protestants after promising them peace and at ansador one hundred were killed and cast part into a jakes and part into a river one hundred put into a prison at orleans were destroyed by the furious multitude the protestants at rochelle who were such as had miraculously escaped the rage of hell and fled there seeing how ill they fared who submitted to those holy devils stood for their lives and some other cities encouraged thereby did the like 
against Rochelle, the king sent almost the whole power of France, which besieged it seven months, though by their assaults they did very little execution on the inhabitants, yet by famine they destroyed eighteen thousand out of two and twenty. The dead, being too numerous for the living to bury, became food for vermin and carnivorous birds. Many took their coffins into the churchyard, laying down in them, and breathed their last. Their diet had long been what the minds of those in plenty shudder at, even human flesh, entrails, dung, and the most loathsome things, became at last the only food of those champions for that truth and liberty of which the world was not worthy. At every attack the besiegers met with such an intrepid reception that they left one hundred and thirty-two captains with a proportionate number of men dead in the field. The siege at last was broken up at the request of the Duke of Anjou, the king's brother, who was proclaimed king of Poland, and the king, being wearied out, easily complied, whereupon honorable conditions were granted them. It is a remarkable interference of providence that, in all this dreadful massacre, not more than two ministers of the gospel were involved in it. The tragical sufferings of the Protestants are too numerous to detail, but the treatment of Philip of Deux will give an idea of the rest. After the miscreants had slain this martyr in his bed, they went to his wife, who was then attended by the midwife, expecting every moment to be delivered. The midwife entreated them to stay the murder, at least till the child, which was the twentieth, should be born. Notwithstanding this, they thrust a dagger up to the hilt into the poor woman. Anxious to be delivered, she ran into a corn loft, but hither they pursued her, stabbed her in the belly, and then threw her into the street. By the fall, the child came from the dying mother, and being caught up by one of the Catholic ruffians, he stabbed the infant, and then threw it into the river. From the Revocation of the Edict of Nantes to the French Revolution in 1789 The persecutions occasioned by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes took place under Louis the Fourteenth. This edict was made by Henry the Great of France in 1598, and secured to the Protestants an equal right in every respect whether civil or religious, with the other subjects of the realm. All those privileges Louis the Fourteenth confirmed to the Protestants by another statute called the Edict of Nismus, and kept them inviolably to the end of his reign. On the accession of Louis the Fourteenth, the kingdom was almost ruined by civil wars. At this critical juncture, the Protestants, heedless of our Lord's admonition, they that take the sword, shall perish with the sword, took such an active part in favor of the king that he was constrained to acknowledge himself indebted to their arms for his establishment on the throne. Instead of cherishing and rewarding that party who had fought for him, he reasoned that the same power which had protected could overturn him, and, listening to the popish machinations, he began to issue out prescriptions and restrictions indicative of his final determination. Rochelle was presently fettered with an incredible number of denunciations. Montauban and Milau were sacked by soldiers. Popish commissioners were appointed to preside over the affairs of the Protestants, and there was no appeal from their ordinance, except to the king's council. This struck at the root of their civil and religious exercises, and prevented them, being Protestants, from suing a Catholic in any court of law. This was followed by another injunction to make an inquiry in all parishes into whatever the Protestants had said or done for twenty years past. This filled the prisons with innocent victims and condemned others to the galleys or banishment. Protestants were expelled from all offices, trades, privileges, and employs, thereby depriving them of the means of getting their bread and they proceeded to such excesses in this brutality that they would not suffer even the midwives to officiate but compelled their women to submit themselves in that crisis of nature to their enemies the brutal catholics their children were taken from them to be educated by the catholics and at seven years of age made to embrace popery 
the reformed were prohibited from relieving their own sick or poor from all private worship and divine service was to be performed in the presence of a popish priest to prevent the unfortunate victims from leaving the kingdom all the passages on the frontiers were strictly guarded yet by the good hand of god about a hundred and fifty escaped their vigilance and emigrated to different countries to relate the dismal narrative all that has been related hitherto were only infringements on their established charter the edict of knots at length the diabolical revocation of that edict passed on the eighteenth of october sixteen eighty five and was registered the twenty second contrary to all form of law instantly the dragoons were quartered upon the protestants throughout the realm and filled all france with the like news that the king would no longer suffer any huguenots in his kingdom and therefore they must resolve to change their religion hereupon the intendants in every parish which were popish governors and spies set over the protestants assembled the reformed inhabitants and told them they must without delay turn catholics either freely or by force the protestants replied that they were ready to sacrifice their lives and estates to the king but their consciences being gods they could not so dispose of them instantly the troops seized the gates and avenues of the cities and placing guards in all the passages entered with sword in hand crying die or be catholics in short they practised every wickedness and horror they could devise to force them to change their religion they hanged both men and women by their hair or their feet and smoked them with hay until they were nearly dead and if they still refused to sign a recantation they hung them up again and repeated their barbarities until wearied out with torments without death they forced many to yield to them others they plucked off all the hair of their heads and beards with pinchers others they threw on great fires and pulled them out again repeating it until they extorted a promise to recant some they stripped naked and after offering them the most infamous insults they stuck them with pins from head to foot and lanced them with pen knives and sometimes with red-hot pincers they dragged them by the nose until they promised to turn sometimes they tied fathers and husbands while they ravished their wives and daughters before their eyes multitudes they imprisoned in the most noisome dungeons where they practised all sorts of torments in secret their wives and children they shut up in monasteries such as endeavoured to escape by flight were pursued in the woods and hunted in the fields and shot at like wild beasts nor did any condition or quality screen them from the ferocity of these infernal dragoons even the members of parliament and military officers though on actual service were ordered to quit their posts and repair directly to their houses to suffer the like storm such as complained to the king were sent to the bastille where they drank the same cup the bishops and the intendants marched at the head of the dragoons with a troop of missionaries monks and other ecclesiastics to animate the soldiers to an execution so agreeable to their holy church and so glorious to their demon god and their tyrant king in forming the edict to repeal the edict of nantes the council were divided some would have all the ministers detained and forced into popery as well as the laity others were for banishing them because their presence would strengthen the protestants in perseverance and if they were forced to turn they would ever be secret and powerful enemies in the bosom of the church by their great knowledge and experience in controversial matters this reason prevailing they were sentenced to banishment and only fifteen days allowed them to depart the kingdom on the same day that the edict for revoking the protestants charter was published they demolished their churches and banished their ministers whom they allowed but twenty-four hours to leave paris the papists would not suffer them to dispose of their effects and threw every obstacle in their way to delay their escape until the limited time was expired which subjected them to the condemnation for life to the galleys the guards were doubled at the seaports and the prisons were filled with the victims who endured torments and wants at which human nature must shudder the sufferings of the ministers and others who were sent to the galleys seemed to exceed all 
chained to the oar, they were exposed to the open air night and day, at all seasons and in all weathers, and when through weakness of body they fainted under the oar, instead of a cordial to revive them, or viands to refresh them, they received only the lashes of a scourge, or the blows of a cane, or rope's end. For the want of sufficient clothing and necessary cleanliness, they were most grievously tormented with vermin, and cruelly pinched with the cold, which removed by night the executioners who beat and tormented them by day. Instead of a bed, they were allowed sick or well only a hard board, eighteen inches broad, to sleep on, without any covering but their wretched apparel, which was a shirt of the coarsest canvas, a little jerkin of red serge, slit on each side up to the armholes, with open sleeves that reached not to the elbow. And once in three years they had a coarse frock, and a little cap to cover their heads, which were always kept close shaved as a mark of their infamy. The allowance of provision was as narrow as the sentiments of those who condemned them to such miseries, and their treatment when sick is too shocking to relate. Doomed to die upon the boards of a dark hold, covered with vermin, and without the least convenience for the cause of nature. Nor was it among the least of the horrors they endured, that, as ministers of Christ and honest men, they were chained side by side to felons and the most execrable villains, whose blasphemous tongues were never idle. If they refused to hear mass, they were sentenced to the bastinado, of which dreadful punishment the following is a description. Preparatory to it, the chains are taken off and the victims delivered into the hands of the Turks that preside at the oars, who strip them quite naked, and stretching them upon a great gun, they are held so that they cannot stir, during which there reigns an awful silence throughout the galley. The Turk, who is appointed the executioner, and who thinks the sacrifice acceptable to his prophet Mohammed, most cruelly beats the wretched victim with the rough cudgel, or knotty rope's end, until the skin is flayed off his bones, and he is near the point of expiring. Then they apply a most tormenting mixture of vinegar and salt, and consign him to that most intolerable hospital where thousands under their cruelties have expired. End of chapter 4, part 2 Recording by Sean F. Sawyers, St. Louis, Missouri Chapter 4, Part 3 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 4, Papal Persecutions, Part 3. Martyrdom of John Calas. We pass over many other individual martyrdoms to insert that of John Calas, which took place as recently as 1761, and is an indubitable proof of the bigotry of popery, and shows that neither experience nor improvement can root out the inveterate prejudices of the Roman Catholics, or render them less cruel or inexorable to Protestants. John Calas, was a merchant of the city of Toulouse, where he had been settled, and lived in good repute, and had married an Englishwoman of French extraction. Calas and his wife were Protestants, and had five sons, whom they educated in the same religion. But Louis, one of the sons, became a Roman Catholic, having been converted by a maidservant who had lived in the family about thirty years. The father, however, did not express any resentment or ill will upon the occasion, but kept the maid in the family and settled an annuity upon the son. In October 1761, the family consisted of John Calas and his wife, one woman servant, Mark Antony Calas, the eldest son, and Peter Calas, the second son. Mark Antony was bred to the law, but could not be admitted to practice on account of his being a Protestant. Hence he grew melancholy, read all the books he could procure relative to suicide, and seemed determined to destroy himself. 
To this may be added that he led a dissipated life, was greatly addicted to gaming, and did all which could constitute the character of a libertine on which account his father frequently reprehended him, and sometimes in terms of severity, which considerably added to the gloom that seemed to oppress him. On the 13th of October, 1761, Mr. Gober Lafaisa, a young gentleman about 19 years of age, the son of Lafaisa, a celebrated advocate of Toulouse, about five o'clock in the evening was met by John Calas, the father, and the eldest son, Mark Antony, who was his friend. Calas, the father, invited him to supper, and the family and their guest sat down in a room up one pair of stairs. The whole company consisted of Calas, the father, and his wife, Antony and Peter Calas, the sons, and Levisa, the guest, no other person being in the house, except the maid-servant who has been already mentioned. It was now about seven o'clock. The supper was not long, but before it was over, Antony left the table and went into the kitchen, which was on the same floor, as he was accustomed to do. The maid asked him if he was cold. He answered, Quite the contrary, I burn, and then left her. In the meantime, his friend and family left the room they had supped in, and went into a bedchamber. The father and Levisa sat down together on a sofa, the younger son Peter in an elbow chair, and the mother in another chair, and without making any inquiry after Antony, continued in conversation together until between nine and ten o'clock, when Levisa took his leave, and Peter, who had fallen asleep, was awakened to attend him with a light. On the ground floor of Calas's house was a shop and a warehouse, the latter of which was divided from the shop by a pair of folding doors. When Peter Calas and Levisa came downstairs into the shop, they were extremely shocked to see Antony hanging in his shirt, from a bar which he had laid across the top of the two folding doors, having half opened them for that purpose. On discovery of this horrid spectacle, they shrieked out, which brought down Calas the father, the mother being seized with such terror as kept her trembling in the passage above. When the maid discovered what had happened, she continued below, either because she feared to carry an account of it to her mistress, or because she busied herself in doing some good office to her master, who was embracing the body of his son, and bathing it in his tears. The mother, therefore, being thus left alone, went down and mixed in the scene that has been already described, with such emotions as it must naturally produce. In the meantime, Peter had been sent for La Moray, a surgeon in the neighborhood. La Moray was not at home, but his apprentice, Mr. Grossel, came instantly. Upon examination, he found the body quite dead, and by this time a papistical crowd of people were gathered about the house, and, having by some means heard that Antony Calas was suddenly dead, and that the surgeon who had examined the body declared he had been strangled, they took it into their heads he had been murdered, and as the family was Protestant, they presently supposed that the young man was about to change his religion and had been put to death for that reason. The poor father, overwhelmed with grief for the loss of his child, was advised by his friends to send for the officers of justice to prevent his being torn to pieces by the Catholic multitude, who supposed he had murdered his son. This was accordingly done, and David, the chief magistrate, or capital, took the father, Peter the son, the mother, Lavasa, and the maid, all into custody, and set a guard over them. He sent for M. de la Tour, a physician, and M. M. la Marquet and Peronet, surgeons, who examined the body for marks of violence, but found none except the mark of the ligature on the neck. They found also the hair of the deceased done up in the usual manner, perfectly smooth, and without the least disorder. His clothes were also regularly folded up and laid upon the counter, nor was his shirt either torn or unbuttoned. Notwithstanding these innocent appearances, the capital thought proper to agree with the opinion of the mob, and took it into his head that old Calas had sent for Levisa, telling him that he had a son to be hanged, that Levisa had come to perform the office of executioner, and that he had received assistance from the father and brother. As no proof of the supposed fact could be procured, the capital had recourse to a monitory or general information in which the crime was taken for granted, 
and persons were required to give such testimony against it as they were able. This recites that Levisa was commissioned by the Protestants to be their executioner in ordinary, when any of their children were to be hanged for changing their religion. It recites also that when the Protestants thus hang their children, they compel them to kneel, and one of the interrogatories was whether any person had seen Antony Calas kneel before his father when he strangled him. It recites likewise that Antony died a Roman Catholic, and requires evidence of his Catholicism. But before this monitory was published, the mob had got a notion that Antony Calas was the next day to have entered into the fraternity of the white penitents. The capital therefore caused his body to be buried in the middle of St. Stephen's Church. A few days after the interment of the deceased, the white penitents performed a solemn service for him in their chapel. The church was hung with white, and a tomb was raised in the middle of it, on the top of which was placed a human skeleton holding in one hand a paper, on which was written, Abjuration of Heresy, and in the other a palm, the emblem of martyrdom. The next day the Franciscans performed a service of the same kind for him. The capital continued the persecution with unrelenting severity, and without the least proof coming in, thought fit to condemn the unhappy father, mother, brother, friend, and servant to the torture and put them all into irons on the 18th of November. From these dreadful proceedings, the sufferers appealed to the Parliament, which immediately took cognizance of the affair, and annulled the sentence of the capital as irregular. But they continued the prosecution, and, upon the hangman deposing it was impossible, Antony should hang himself, as was pretended, the majority of the Parliament were of the opinion that the prisoners were guilty, and therefore ordered them to be tried by the criminal court of Toulouse. One voted him innocent, but after long debates, the majority was for the torture and wheel, and probably condemned the father by way of experiment, whether he was guilty or not, hoping he would, in the agony, confess the crime and accuse the other prisoners, whose fate, therefore, they suspended. Poor Calas, however, an old man of sixty-eight, was condemned to this dreadful punishment alone. He suffered the torture with great constancy, and was led to execution in a frame of mind which excited the admiration of all that saw him, and particularly two of the Dominicans, Father Borges and Father Coldigues, who attended him in his last moments, and declared that they thought him not only innocent of the crime laid to his charge, but also an exemplary instance of true Christian patience, fortitude, and charity. When he saw the executioner prepared to give him the last stroke, he made a fresh declaration to Father Borges, but while the words were still in his mouth, the capital, the author of this catastrophe, who came upon the scaffold merely to gratify his desire of being a witness of his punishment and death, ran up to him and bawled out, Wretch, there are faggots which are to reduce your body to ashes. Speak the truth. M. Calas made no reply but turned his head a little aside, and that moment the executioner did his office. The popular outcry against this family was so violent in Languedoc that everybody expected to see the children of Calas broke upon the wheel and the mother burnt alive. Young Donat Calas was advised to fly to Switzerland. He went and found a gentleman who, at first, could only pity and relieve him without daring to judge of the rigor exercised against the father, mother, and brothers. Soon after, one of the brothers, who was only banished, likewise threw himself into the arms of the same person, who, for more than a month, took every possible precaution to be assured of the innocence of the family. Once convinced, he thought himself obliged, in conscience, to employ his friends, his purse, his pen, and his credit, to repair the fatal mistake of the seven judges of Toulouse, and to have the proceedings revised by the king's council. This revision lasted three years, and it is well known what honor Messrs. de Grosne and Bacuancourt acquired by investigating this memorable cause. Fifty masters of the court of requests unanimously declared the whole family of Calas innocent, and recommended them to the benevolent justice of his majesty. The Duke de Choiseul, who never let slip an opportunity of signalizing the greatness of his character, 
not only assisted this unfortunate family with money, but obtained for them a gratuity of 36,000 livres from the king. On the 9th of March, 1765, the arrest was signed which justified the family of Calas and changed their fate. The 9th of March, 1762, was the very day on which the innocent and virtuous father of that family had been executed. All Paris ran in crowds to see them come out of prison, and clapped their hands for joy, while the tears streamed from their eyes. This dreadful example of bigotry employed the pen of Voltaire in deprecation of the horrors of superstition. And though an infidel himself, his essay on toleration does honor to his pen, and has been a blessed means of abating the rigor of persecution in most European states. Gospel purity will equally shun superstition and cruelty, as the mildness of Christ's tenets teaches only to comfort in this world, and to procure salvation in the next. To persecute for being of a different opinion is as absurd as to persecute for having a different countenance. If we honor God, keep sacred the pure doctrines of Christ, put a full confidence in the promises contained in the Holy Scriptures, and obey the political laws of the state in which we reside, we have an undoubted right to protection instead of persecution, and to serve heaven as our conscience, regulated by the gospel rules, may direct. End of chapter 4 Recording by Sean F. Sawyers, O'Fallon, Missouri